Good morning, Cornerstone. Great to be here with you. Please get your Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible, put your hand up and we'll bring one to you. You know, every Sunday I encourage you to get a Bible in your hand. I just want to I want to give you a few thoughts related to that. Just thinking about this while we're singing that last song there. You know, I know it can be easy just to assume it really doesn't matter that I actually get a Bible in my hand. I'm hearing the Bible preached. Uh, I know that it's being read in my presence. I'm listening to it. I want to just want to, want to challenge that thought for a minute as an encouragement to you. The way that we interact with the world is through the senses, right? Are you guys awake? Is that right? Yeah. We have these senses, these means of interacting. We see, we hear, we touch taste, we smell. And what we have in the word of God is we have like the most powerful, tangible thing on planet earth. This is a spiritually powerful, tangible book. I could give you lots of verses that would back that up. It's, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to cut to the dividing of joint and marrow of soul and spirit, judge the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word of God is profitable for teaching, reproving, correcting, training in righteousness so that the follower of Jesus can be fully built up, fully matured. It's like a rock that smashes David says, I've hidden your word in my heart, God, so that I may not sin against you. He's got this power to help us to live faithfully without sin. So this is this incredibly powerful thing that God has given to us. And he's given us senses. And the way we engage with this incredibly powerful gift is we engage it through the senses. So the more that we can engage it, the better it is. We can hear it as you sit there, great, that's good, that's one of the senses. You can look at it if you have it in your hand, that's good, you're engaging it in a second way. You can feel it, the weight of it physically, pointing to the reality, to its great weight and influence spiritually. One of the things we did this morning, engaging with the truth in God's word, we tasted, that was communion. That's related to the truth that's in here. Maybe the one that we haven't hit is smell. I, I was thinking sitting there, uh, I wish I could like develop a, you know, a scratch and sniff Bible. I don't mean that to be facetious or flippant. I mean like when you're studying one of the great doctrines like the doctrine of atonement, if the scent of atonement, whatever that would be, would come off the page and it would help lock that truth and press you in that sense. But you see, what I'm saying is it's good to get the word of God in our hands and look at it and feel it and listen to it because it is like nothing else on the planet. So please open to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's what we're doing Beginning this morning, I'm starting a new series this morning. I'll give you the idea behind the series and what we're going to do specifically in this intro message. What the series is about, it's really 
maybe the simplest way to state it, it's about what it means to live the Christian life. What is involved in living the Christian life or how has God intended for us to live the Christian life or what has God given to us so that we can live the Christian life. And what I would call those kind of doctrinally is the means of grace. What are the means of grace? You see, grace, when you hear that word grace, biblically speaking, that should trigger in your mind something I don't deserve that's freely given out of the love, the grace of God. It's a gift given to me. I don't earn it in any way. It's just given out of the goodness of God. And so you have saving grace. That's that work of Jesus Christ that makes it possible for you to go from being dead in sin to being alive, from being blind to truth to seeing, from being in bondage to sin to being forgiven and freed, from being condemned and headed to hell to being at peace with God, with the promise of an eternal future with him coming. You see, that's saving grace. And then you have grace that's sanctifying grace. That would be the grace of God, still undeserved, but the grace of God that enables you to live how he wants you to live. It encourages you along the path. It directs you, grace that directs you and says, this is the way. Grace that answers questions for you when you have them and things aren't making sense. Grace that brings comfort to you in the midst of brokenness. On and on and on. Aspects of sanctifying grace. So what God has given to us are means of grace. Means both to save us and then after we're saved, means to come alongside of us that we can use to have him take us along the path of the Christian life so that that life is lived. in a pleasing way to him. So that's the idea behind the series that we're beginning. And this morning is an introductory message. And here's how I want to start with the truth of this introduction to this message. And it's this. It's a question. What is the purpose of God for your life? Overall, big picture, what is the purpose of God for your life? I can give that to you. I'm going to give it to you biblically. We're going to see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you look there in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31? Paul writing to the church at Corinth, to a group of believers, listen to what he says. Look at what he says. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, pause. How many things in life has he just covered? Everything. And what does he say about everything in life? Do all to the glory of God. What is the purpose of God for your life? The purpose of God for your life is to live your life for his glory. In fact, the purpose of every single thing in this universe, intelligent, unintelligent, all matter, the all things spiritual, the purpose is the glory of God. It is all about God. And that idea right there that our life, the purpose of our life is to be 
each day, each moment lived with a view toward the glory of God may be one of the single hardest things to keep your heart beating after your mind fixed upon God's glory is to be the wellspring of your worldview, the way you look at everything. To keep this constantly before us day in and day out, circumstance by circumstance, is a challenge because here's the truth. The pervasive tendency of humanity is to be distracted by schedules, derailed by successes, deterred by problems, defeated by temptations. But the purpose, God's purpose for you is to live for his glory. But before we talk about what it means to do that, what it looks like to do that. Let me just identify a few things that will not happen when you make it your life's purpose to live for God's glory. And I want to tell you these things so that you don't become you know, disillusioned when you make a concerted effort to live for God's glory and things don't just start working out. You see, what will not happen when you live for God's glory is troubles are not going to end. What do I mean by that? I mean this. Your car is still going to break down. Your child is going to rebel. Your stocks are going to plummet. The boss is still going to be mean. Your employees are still going to be lazy when you live for the glory of God. Your waistline will grow and your bank account will shrink even when you live for the glory of God. Your head will still go bald. The flu shot still won't work. IRS is still going to expect your money when you're living all out for the glory of God. But what will happen? What will happen when you live for the glory of God? Let me just give you a few bullet points to get your thought processes running there when you live for the glory of God. Here's just a short list. Every need will be met. Every need will be met. I I have the Lord as my shepherd. I shall not want. Every need's going to be met. Every storm is going to be weathered. Your toddlers will respect you. Your adult children will in most cases seek to emulate you. The devil will hate you and the demons will fear you when you live for the glory of God. Truth will uphold you God's goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. God's spirit will fill you and your reputation will precede you. You'll spend a lifetime serving here and then you'll spend an eternity reigning there when you live for the glory of God. You may not leave a packed trust when you live for the glory of God, but you will leave a powerful legacy. You may not get the keys to a big house here, but you'll get escorted to your eternal dream home there. God will reward you forever and there'll be no taxes on it. And to top it all off, 
regardless of who your president is, God's still going to be your king when you live for the glory of God. The purpose of our life as defined by our creator is to live for his glory. But what specifically does that look like? What does it mean to live for the glory of God? How can we describe that? Well, we have the perfect picture of what it means to live for the glory of God. We have the perfect personification of what it looks like to live for the glory of God. It's this. Here's the second point for this morning. It's to live like God's son. Point one, live for God's glory. That's God's overall purpose. Second point is this, live like God's son. That's how you live for the glory of God. You see, that's what living for the glory of God looks like. You want to see it fleshed out in daily expression in a real life. You look to the person of Jesus Christ. He is the absolute perfection of what it means to live for the glory of God. Romans 8. Would you please turn there? Paul in Romans 8 actually describes what God's ultimate goal is for every single one of his children. Romans chapter 8, a few weeks back, we looked at Romans 8, 28. Now let's look at this verse in Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 Paul writes in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he, whom God foreknew, it's talking about those that he eternally knew as his sons and daughters, determined that he was gonna call to himself and save those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to what, church? Let's try that a little more assertively. He determined that we would be predestined to be conformed to what, church? The image of his son. His predetermined plan for every single one of us. His eternal plan for everyone that he would make his own is that they would become like his son, Jesus Christ. That's the personification. That's what it looks like to live for the glory of God. God wants us like his son, That's the model. That's the model. Live for God's glory by living like God's son. That's the model. So what is the means for doing that? That's the series. What's the means? How do we access what God has made available to us so that we can be transformed in increasing measure into the likeness of Jesus Christ. You see, if becoming like Jesus is God's goal for every one of his children, and it absolutely is repeatedly stated in Scripture, then here's the question we can ask to guide us going forward in this series. How did Jesus become Jesus? Now, before you think I'm speaking heresy, just take the thought and let's run with that for a minute. How did Jesus become Jesus? 
I am not referring in that question to the deity of Jesus. You see, Jesus is eternal God. He doesn't become anything. He's always been God. There is no movement or change. A part of what it means to be God is immutability. That means he changes not. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has always been God. He is God. He will always be God. Yet what the second member of the Godhead did was that he condescended and took a human nature and joined it perfectly with his divine nature. He entered into the human reality that we live in fully 100% like we live in it. And in that full humanity, Jesus interacted in the 33 years that he lived on this planet in a human flesh walking the shores of Palestine. He interacted and related and lived through an existence here just like we do. That means he had to learn like we learn in his humanity. He had to grow like we grow. He had to mature. He had to discover. As God, he didn't. But as man, he did. Not 50% God, 50% man. 100% God, 100% man, joined together in a perfect union, yet in that union, the divinity didn't spill over into the humanity and the humanity didn't spill over into the divinity. They were completely distinct yet perfectly joined so that in his humanity, he had to live just like we do. So the question then, if we're, and what my intention is, is to seek in the word of God, an answer to how do we live this Christian life? Well, the answer's in the title. Christian starts with what? Christ. Jesus is the model. So the question is, how did Jesus the man become Jesus the man? How did Jesus the child, how did Jesus the adolescent grow up and become Jesus the atoning Savior, the loving Savior. Well, if we can look on the pages of Scripture and find some aspects to his growth and development as a man, we can say that's our calling, that's our path right there. And I'm going to show you a few. Jesus the boy, Jesus the man, into Jesus the Savior of humanity. Luke chapter 2. Please turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at Jesus at 12 years old. Jesus the adolescent. This is the storyline where the earthly Father and mother of the God-man, Jesus Christ, lost him for three days. It's just a surreal story. They actually left the city of Jerusalem, had went there for a holiday, a Jewish holy day, as Jews in the, all in the surrounding area had made that trip during that time, crowded, big family unit, extended family, and somehow they are with Jerusalem way in the distance. Nobody's seen Jesus for a while, and they realize that they've lost him. Needless to say, they are anxious to get back and find him. They do. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 46. Let's see if we can get a clue to how Jesus became Jesus here. Luke 2, 46. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Now, so often when we read this intriguing story, we move to the next verse, which talks about how amazed the people were there at the level of understanding that this 12-year-old had. But don't jump to the next verse. Just look at verse 26. What does it say that Jesus was doing here? He was learning the truth of the word of God, sitting among the teachers, quote, listening to them and asking them questions. This is... God, who is the truth, the living embodiment of truth. God, who authored the truth. God, who needed to learn nothing, yet the adolescent Jesus who did need to learn. And so he subjected himself just like we have to learn walking through this life just like we have to, giving us a picture of what it looks like. And here he is, willingly subjecting himself to the developing process of learning. If we are to be like Jesus, what we need to do like Jesus is our development will include growth through the study of the scriptures. That's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus became Jesus by growing through the study of the scriptures. Growth through scriptural study. Here's the second path or means of grace that I'd identify that was involved in Jesus' growth. Look down a few verses to Luke 2, 51 to 52. Same story. Luke 2, 51. And he, Jesus, went down with them, referring to his parents, Joseph and Mary, and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Here is the creator of all with peasant parents, poor parents. And how did he relate to them? In obedience, he was submissive to them. You see, Jesus did not just grow physically. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. What was the means of growth for his development? It was submission. And his mother, again, Luke 2, 51 and 52, and his mother treasured up all these things in his heart and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And the means by which he increased was through submission. Question, how are you doing in the area of submission, son or daughter of God? How are you doing in the area of submission? Jesus willingly submitted himself to earthly parents even though he was their creator. Are you willingly submitting yourself to whatever circumstances God puts you in in life? Even if you feel like you don't deserve to be in them, Submission to your circumstances in life in obedience to God is a key way that you display your trust in God. 
by submitting even when we don't feel like we should have to. Here's what it shows. It shows that we understand that God is over all things. And whatever he is allowing us to go through, he is guiding us. He's with us. He's not leaving or forsaking us. And the way that we can walk through that with his blessing, even when the difficulties are seemingly more than we can bear, is by in trust, submitting to him in the midst of it. Jesus grew through the study of the scriptures. Jesus grew through submission. And then number three, Jesus grew through suffering. Go to Hebrews chapter five. Hebrews chapter five. I'm gonna read verses eight and nine. There's just, some statements here in these two verses that just on the surface, if you, you're not thinking correctly about uh, you know, the hypostatic union is what it's called theologically, that joining of the, the divine nature and the human nature perfectly without confounding the two, mixing the two. Uh, if you don't keep that in view correctly, this verse or this passage can really kind of throw you for a loop. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Although he, Jesus, was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Here's what I mean that seems to like rise up and say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. If you're thinking about the divinity of Jesus, fully divine, then what rises up just in striking relief here is, how could he learn obedience? He's God. He's never disobedient. He's always perfectly righteous. And how could he be made perfect? He already is perfect as God. He's got all the attributes, eternally has, in the infinitude as the divine God, and how could he become something, become the source of eternal salvation? To become something is to change. He can't change. Well, that's all true with his divinity, but with his humanity, he did need to learn obedience. Now, don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean he went from disobedience to obedience. That's not what it's talking about when it says learn obedience. It means this. Until Jesus had come as a child, grew up through adolescence, became an adult, walked through his three years of ministry and willingly went to the cross and allowed them to drive the spikes in his wrists, press the thorn crown of thorns into his brow, rip the flesh off his back in flogging, beat him with sticks, spit on him, mock him, ridicule him, strip him, and hang him up to die until he, on the cross with his last breath, committed, willingly committed himself to death, committing his spirit to the Father. Until he had done that, he had not obeyed, meaning fulfilled the plan that the Father had sent him to fulfill. It's when he had done that that he had become obedient to the will of his Father. Not that he was disobedient, he just had not yet in a moment of time in his humanity accomplished all that he was sent to accomplish. And when he did, he was learning what it meant to be obedient in the greatest suffering that humanity has ever seen. And being made perfect, that means this, he was made our perfect savior through the atonement, through the sacrifice of his own sinlessness, 
to pay the penalty, taking our sins upon himself, paying their penalty, that is what made him the perfect savior for us because what we have in him is this. We have a savior that knows what it means to suffer. He's plumbed the depths of suffering like we will never understand. We get glimpses of it, some of us more than others. And some of the, the sufferings that people encounter are so much deeper than sufferings that I have encountered. I don't want to be in feeling about that at all. But I'm saying this, no one has ever plumbed the depths of suffering like the person of Jesus Christ. He is the man, fully man, that knows what it means to suffer, tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So you have a high priest on the throne of heaven. If you're a son or a daughter of God, trusted in Jesus, you have a high priest on the throne of heaven that knows what it means to face pain and heartache and brokenness and suffering in this world, making him the perfect savior in verse 9 so that he became the source of eternal salvation. You see, how did Jesus become Jesus in his humanity? Well, he grew through the study of the scriptures. He grew through submission, and he grew through suffering. To be a Christian is to be a follower of Jesus. If you and I if the goal is for us to live for God's glory by living like the Son, we are going to need to walk the path of the study of the Scriptures and of submission in obedience to God in whatever circumstances He puts us in in life and through suffering in this life on this broken planet. We're going to need to grow in Christ's likeness through those same journeys in life. So, point number one, live for God's glory. Point number two, by living like God's son. And point number three, the way that you live like God's son is in the power of the spirit. Live in the power of the spirit. That is the only way you're going to be enabled to live in increasing measure like the person of Jesus Christ. It's with the power of the Holy Spirit helping you, and he wants to help you. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. The Bible is definitively clear on that. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ is not Christ's, and everyone who is Christ has the Spirit of Christ. Jesus Jesus sent him to us. He said, Acts 1 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He sends his Spirit, gives us brand new life. The Spirit brings us to new life through faith in the Son and dwells within us to guide us, to strengthen us, to convict us, to direct us to transform us in increasing measure into the likeness of Jesus. We need to live in the power of the Spirit of God. So how are we to do that? I'm going to give you three things and then I'll close. And then we'll, in the weeks to come, we'll flesh out what it means to live for God's glory by living like God's Son by living in the power of the Spirit. And what I want to close with is three ways not to live with the Spirit. Before we look at how to do that, I want to tell you how not to do that because the Bible tells us how not to do that. Ephesians chapter 4, please turn there quickly, Ephesians 4 verse 30. Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, 30 through 32. 
Paul writes, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Did you hear that? Don't do what? Don't grieve the Spirit. How not to live in the power of God's Spirit? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And now he's going to give a little bit of commentary on that explanation. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind, here's the opposite, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So let me give you kind of an overall principle here. To grieve the Holy Spirit is related to how we treat other people at least in large part here. Because immediately following this statement, not to grieve the Spirit, what do we have? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away, and malice. That's wrong actions and relationships to others. And then positive, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. You see... Bitterness, let all bitterness, right? Bitterness is a position that we internally take against someone else that has wronged us or we believe has wronged us. The Bible is clear. Bitterness is wrong. Bitterness is sin. If you were truly wronged, sinned against, unjustly treated, one sin does not Give permission for another. Bitterness does not solve the problem of the injustice done to you. In fact, just think about this. To think that we are somehow justified to be bitter when we have been unjustly treated by someone else we are cutting that bitterness from the same cloth that that unjust treatment was cut from. They're both cut from the cloth of sin. How does one sin help deal with another sin? It only compounds the problem. Don't be bitter and it It's like two bookends here. Let all bitterness be gone and then at the very end of the positive side, forgiving one another. There's the opposite right there. So you have these two bookends. Don't be bitter, forgive one another. And then in the middle, you have all of these other relational aspects, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. You see, those are heart issues. Listen, The Holy Spirit's living in you. He doesn't want to live in a place of malice and anger and wrath. That's not a home to him. That's not an environment where he is at peace with. Bitterness is an infectious disease. It, It doesn't help you. It hurts you. It compounds the problem. Bitterness is like an infectious disease. It's never satisfied just to stay with itself. What is it intended to do? It wants to spread the very nature of what it is. It wants to spread its poison. It wants to spread its disease. Don't be bitter. Don't grieve the Spirit of God in the way that you relate to the other believers around you or the lost world around you. Don't grieve the spirit and how you treat others. Secondly, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Please turn there. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. The second way not to live with the spirit. First Thessalonians 5.19. Read a few verses here. Paul writes, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Stain from every form of evil. 
Don't do what to the Spirit? Don't quench the Spirit. Quenching the Spirit has to do with how we relate to God's truth. The word here, quench, you know, pictures like a fire. Think of fire. How do you quench a fire? You douse it. You smother it to keep it from burning, to keep it from doing what it is intended to do. We quench the Spirit when we do not properly respond to and engage with the Word of God. The Word of God by the Spirit's work, wants to be an active source in our life. We are to hear it, to listen to it, to read it, to study it, so that the Spirit of God can take that and use it for training and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, says in Hebrews. Jesus prayed to his Father for his followers, sanctify them by the truth, your Word is truth. How are we transformed? By the truth. So we quench the Spirit when we don't respond properly, meaning when we don't access the Word and apply the Word. We quench the Spirit. That's not how you're going to live in the power of the Spirit if you're quenching the Spirit by a misuse of the Word or no use of the Word. And then number three, Here's the third thing we should not do. We shouldn't insult the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Hebrews 10, 29. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. There it is. The picture here being painted by the author of Hebrews is someone who is outraging the Spirit of of God, by trampling underfoot the Son of God, profaning the blood that was shed to redeem them. You see, when you think of or you hear the word outrage, not a super common word, think of insult. Think of serious insult, bold insult. When you outrage or insult the grace of God. This is to do something offensively disrespectful, kind of boldly, offensively disrespectful against the Spirit of God. Deliberately, boldly, aggressively sinning is an insult to the Spirit of grace if you're a believer. It's an offense to the credible price paid that provides grace to save us from sin. So outraging the spirit or insulting the spirit relates to how we treat grace and sin. How we treat grace and sin. How we insult abuse grace and how we flippantly act toward sin. That's insulting the spirit. So how not to live by the power of the spirit. Don't grieve him. Don't quench him and don't insult him. How do you live then by the spirit? Just one more section of scripture. Ephesians 5. Now we're kind of coming to the portal here through which we're going to launch into the weeks to come. But in Galatians 5, here we have this answer to this question. If we're to live for God's glory by living like God's Son in the power of God's Spirit, how do we live 
in the power of God's Spirit. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, this is telling us that here is what the Spirit is producing in the lives of followers of Jesus. He's producing fruit that's love, described as joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's a question. How does the Spirit of God produce those fruits in us? It's Him that does it, but how does He do it? Well, how are your physical muscles built? By what? By resistance, right? Right? By resistance, think about this. If you apply that physical principle to the spiritual principle to produce the fruit of love in us, God allows us to encounter unlovely people. To produce joy in us, he allows us to go through sorrows. To produce peace He allows the storm to produce patience. He makes us wait to produce faithfulness. He turns the light out. You see, this is the Spirit of God working in the circumstances of life, doing the good work of producing the fruit of the Spirit because What it means to live like Jesus is to live in a profusion of the fruit of the Spirit because Jesus is the embodiment of perfect love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Two verses down, Galatians 5.25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So how do we live with God's Spirit? We keep up. We keep in step with the Spirit. We utilize the means of grace that God has given us by which the Spirit will work in our life in power so that we can be transformed into the likeness of the Son so that we can live a life for the glory of God. And so what we're going to look at in the weeks to come is how to do that. How can we utilize what are the means of grace that God has given that his spirit will use in us so that that process can happen in us. Would you please stand? So Father, I just, first of all, I just want to thank you that you do have a plan. Thank you that your plan is good. Thank you that you're a good God and that your ultimate promise for all of your children is eternal glory where we are fully mature modeling the person, the character of Jesus. And so from now until then, we're on this journey where we're needing your power, the power of your spirit to day by day, circumstance by circumstance, transform us from one degree to the next more and more like your son so that our lives more and more through that change can be lives that glorify you. Would you do that? Would you use the weeks to come, the studies, the word that we're going to dive into to move us along in that God-glorifying process. In Jesus' name, amen.